Hi, thank you for those who have joined in. My name is Talish Ray and uh, as the mention went, I'm a lawyer, but I'm also a history enthusiast. I'm here in my capacity as the curator for Talish Ka Tehel Rama and I'd like to start by first thanking Sahabidia for giving me uh, this opportunity along with the sponsors that is for the Pune project, the cultural mapping project that is uh, Tata Technologies, also Map My India, and of course uh, the Heritage Work pro project that uh, Sahapedia carries out. So as most of you who would have joined in here would have read from the blurb, we're here to talk about the textile traditions of Pune, which is a part of the Pune Cultural Mapping Project. And I'd really like to start with, uh, you know, having a word about what is cultural mapping. Cultural mapping essentially is the mapping of all tangible and intangible cultural elements around the geographical area. In this case, it is for Pune. And the reason that this sort of a mapping is done is in order to record the, the cultural records of the place that are there. And in that sense, uh, textiles actually become fairly important because if you look at textiles, textiles have uh, a way of being able to project uh, the history as well as uh, the economic prosperity of any region. And textiles are also something that are evolving. So as a craft form, it's not just something that one is uh, using in a day-to-day -day basis. It's that usage that also changes this craft form as, as we go along. So when we look at Pune, we, we are fairly aware of the fact that Pune really reached in terms of, um, uh, you know, its uh, its prosperity, it was uh, while it was established during the Idil Shahi kingdoms. Uh, it was during the Peshwa reign that Pune flowered, and uh, thereafter it continued to play a fairly important role under the British as well. In fact, even today you have an area in Pune called the Camp area, which was the cantonment area. And from then on, it also played a very pivotal role in the in the struggle for freedom, the national struggle for freedom that went on. And all of these things are uh, things that have had an impact on the textile of the city. So much so that during the course of our research, uh, we found out that there is uh, even today his, uh, oral historical traditions that exist about how when... Um, uh, Mrs. Kasturba Gandhi died. The the cloth which went in for her shroud, which were the dealers that provided it during the time. So when we are looking at the Pune region, we we see that you know that there's been an impact of all of these epochs upon the textile. Now, one of the things to understand about textiles, specifically uh, textiles in the pre-mechanized uh, era, which is the the handloom textile, is that it was very dependent on the weavers that have been around. So uh, in terms of the weavers as craftsmen, they moved around depending on the patronage. So we have a fair bit of evidence to see that uh, during the Peshwa era, we had weavers that came into the Pune region and settled within the various pates that were there as was allocated and developed this craft form around textiles there and there were various uh, types of textiles that were developed there and produced there that handloom but as <clears throat> we moved on with the national struggle. That is when the textile of that region was very influenced by uh, the Swadeshi movement, which also led to the start of uh, a, a tradition of Swadeshi stores within Pune. But from there, it went on when the mechanization came in. And in all of Maharashtra, there was, there was uh, the rise of uh, machine mills, mills that could produce cloth. We see that Pune then had a decline of handlooms that were there. So from the Gazette, which talks about how there were over 400 families of craftsmen that wove fine silk and fine cotton, we find that very gradually those uh, a migration of weavers to Pune stopped. So as such, if you look at it, uh, it is only after till about the 1920s to 1930s that you had uh, weavers coming in as far away as from uh, Andhra Pradesh and Telangana and Karnataka. But however, with the rise of uh, textile mills, the handloom tradition slowly died out. And by the time in the 1970s, handloom itself had moved out from Pune. In fact, as of today, in even in terms of power looms, it is only the Pune silk mills in Thiur which continues to produce uh, local cloth. All other textile traditions or usage that is there is actually provided by the hinterland area. So a lot of the Pune weavers um, have, it is suggested, have moved on to areas like Paitan, like Yola or uh, Kolapur or Ichankalanji or Malegaon. And it is from there that those uh, textiles come in, which service the uh, the city today. 
So when we when we look, talk about all sorts of textile traditions, I think one of the few things that we first need to understand is that uh, what is the kind of uh, uh, you know traditional wear that is uh, prevalent in Pune even today. And traditional wear in Pune has been pretty much restricted to around festivals in in terms of uh, community festivals, whether it is the Ganesh Puja or in terms of marriages and other such uh, uh, you know communions that take place. And it is from there that you see that there is a very distinct form that is there of a Puneri dressing that, that would be called in that sense. So there are the men and the women who dress in a particular ethnic way. And that is also very influenced by uh, the socioeconomic status, but also in terms of the caste hierarchies. So where the men are concerned, typically they have what is known as a dhotar, which is nothing more than an unstitched piece of cloth, which is worn as a dhoti. And then along with that, they also have uh, a, a very distinctive kind of kurta, which is known as the sadra. The sadra actually has pockets in both sides. And of course, there is an, uh, you know, there's a bandi that is worn under it. In terms of the dhotar, the dhotar typically tends to be a pitambar dhotar, which is a silk, yellow silk dhotar, which is worn for auspicious occasions. But one of the other uh, prominent features of, of men dressing in the Pune region is the fact that they wear what is known as a shela or a shawl that or a stole that is taken over the shoulder, which is typically, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, which is typically made out of a material which would have a lot of, um, uh, you know, gold and silver thread woven through it. For the women, it is typically a choli and a uh, a, a, a form of sari which is locally referred to as the lungra but otherwise uh, overall known as the nawari or the nine yard that is also a very specific style of how the sari is worn now in the nawari as well there are various variations that come across and that variations could be in terms of how uh, a particular caste or a community wore it so for example uh, the the nawari that is worn by the Brahmins has a particular style of wearing and it is often recognized by a small fold which operates like a pocket which is known as the kashti or it could be in any other it could be in the maratha style it could also be in the in the lavani style which is how which is a folk art that is followed so there are various kinds and it's an evolving way as to how the nawari is worn though typically today what we find is that even as you go around retail centers in Pune, you will not be able to find a salesperson who would be able to teach you how to tie an awari. The standard services that are offered at most of these places is that you can uh, uh, choose the sari of your liking. You can then go across to a tailor which might be attached to the shop who will pre-stitch the nawari for you. So as such, the Nawari itself has moved in its form from being a free flowing tight thing where, uh, you know, the traditions of how a Nawari are tied are typically something that was associated with the previous generation. And a lot of the current generation relies upon stitched Nawaris that are there. Again, the women also, along with the other forms of jewelry, were also known to be wearing what is known as the Shela. So both the men and the women wore the Shela. The more contentious thing is about the headgear. Now, it's not very certain whether women uh, traditionally wore a headgear or not because there are uh, conflicting accounts on both but to, in today's day and age it is mostly the men who are uh, who wear either uh, a, a form of a headgear which is which is there it could be a topi it could be a gandhi topi which is again influenced by uh, the freedom struggle or it could be a feta or it could be a pagdi and each of these pagdis are of a different kind so there are there are various kinds of headgears that are there uh, incidentally in pune today in terms of the headgear most places you would find them again there uh, these are headgears that are typically uh, already pre-made in some places you can of course uh, avail the services of the only pagarband that is around and present today which is uh, the murunkar jhandewala which is where uh, they do offer those services but most people do come to them for pre-stitched uh, uh, feta that is there so you have what is the elaborately worn headgear which is known as the feta then you have, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the Gandhi topi. Then you also have things like uh, the chakri, chakri pagri, which is actually the original sort of pagri which was tied around, which is a very long cloth which was tied around the head, which then evolved into what, what is known as the Peshwai pagri. Again, that's something that's very visible in, uh, you know, political rallies. Again, it's very visible in any sort of period films that are made around. And then you have various other kinds of pagris that are there. The Sadar pagri, you have the Tukaram pagri, you have the... Vithoba Pagri, which is again used for a temple that's there. And where the feta and the Pagri are concerned, again, 
time they were very dependent upon what the caste equation is, how it is associated, because certain kinds of pragadis are again associated with upper caste and certain kinds of uh, fetas are associated with the more common man. And th those are controversies that have continued to burn as, as late as the last 10 years when there was a certain controversy in, in, <clears throat> in a particular educational institution. But in all of this, when we look at what is what is the material that is made, and that's when it becomes really interesting, because as of today, as I was mentioning, uh, while handloom was very prevalent during the Peshwa fire, and it, as late as the 19th century, and I'm talking about the Gazette notification that was done by the British, um, you had a reference of various places where there were craftsmen, and there were craftsmen who wove uh, threads of gold and silver. There were craftsmen who who were weavers who wove various kinds of material. There were felt makers. Uh, there were also, um, you know, speci specific uh, reference has been made to a particular uh, community, which comprised of only tailors. In fact, they were called as Shimpi. In fact, and there was a, a, a there was a particular laneway which was dedicated to them called the Shimpi Ali. Unfortunately, today while Shimpi Ali exists, there it is difficult to find uh, Shimpis who associate with the trade because most of them have either moved up or there are newer kinds of tailors that have come in in the region. But when we are looking in terms of the textiles that that uh, compose, which even today survive and are very popular today, I think the top uh, place that uh, will be taken would be by. Um, uh, would be by the Paitani. And that's quintessentially always associated with uh, the Marathi culture. And it is also associated with Pune in that sense. So Paitani is a form of either cotton or silk weaving. And that's that's the surprising part about Paitani that while Paitani continues to be popular, it did not become popular today. There is reference of the Paitani way back in the second century BC, where there is reference of a particular kind of cloth leaving Python the current day python for the, uh, trade with the Romans. And from there, it is also recorded that the Adil Shahis were very uh, fond of that cloth from the time where that the Nizam of Hyderabad is supposed to have encouraged it to the time that the weavers actually moved in uh, into Pune and then from Pune moved to Python as well as Yola. And those are the two centers that primarily produce pythony that is, uh, uh, you know, that popular in Pune today. In terms of the pythony, what's important to remember is that there is a particular kind of pattern that comes in in a color combination. And while you have a various amount of playing, typically a pythony is going to be of very bright, vibrant jewel tone. So you can think of, um, you know, you can think of purples, you're thinking of greens, you're thinking of bright hot pinks, and they come with very specific motives. Now, these motives, again, are derived from the various forms of life all around. So you have uh, the Pythony motive, which will typically be uh, a dual uh, peacock motive, which is which is very prevalent. Then you have the Munia, which is a small bird that would be made all across the Pythony. You also have certain flower patterns that, that have come about in the Pythony. There is also the tradition of cotton Pythonies. Now, for a Pythony, it is also important to remember that typically because a Pythony is worn on a very special ceremonial occasion, most Puneri women are likely to take a Shaila with it as well. Now, Pythonies again can be in Navari or they could be in the standard six yard Nivi pattern, which is actually worn and woven, uh, uh, woven and worn around today. But over and above the Pythony, I think there's, it's also very important to mention that, uh, you know, there are other things that, that sort of uh, have been popular. So it's not, it's not just uh, Pythony that has taken and uh, been the, around in Pune. There's also the tradition of Himru weaving and Mashru weaving. Himru is nothing more than uh, what we understand typically as gold and silver that is woven through and also referred to in other places as uh, Kimkhwa. This typically started with uh, weaving that took place in the Adil Shahi kingdoms, but also moved around in, in terms of Pune. It is supposed to be something which was typically worn by the royalty. Now you find Himru much more in the Shaila pattern rather than the, the saris itself. Then you have Mashru. Mashru is typically what was uh, uh, woven silk on silk. Typically, it was also something where uh, ikat patterns were adopted and the mashru was something that was worn more by the common man, whereas himru was actually pretty much uh, relegated to those that were upper socioeconomic order. Uh, you can't really have a mention of the textiles of Pune unless you are uh, also dealing with the what is known as the khun fabric. Now, khun fabric today is produced in and around the Bergam or the North Canada or North Karnataka area. 
Khun in essentially started out as a, a cotton plus um, silk weave, and Khun till about about ten years back was only a fabric that was associated with the choli or the upper garment. It wasn't really associated with anything else. And basically, the idea behind a Khun fabric was that it was worn in and around um, by most people on a regular basis. It was very comfortable to wear, but also that you could find them in bright colors, and therefore it allowed jackets and cholis to be made from them, which were used day on day and could be paired with anything that you were wearing. So if you you had you had patterns that would go with almost everything khun today has evolved itself into something where you also have uh, you know khun sarees that have been available and that's that's one of the more significant later developments that has come about khun is actually very very popular you can actually find it all over it is typically difficult to find a khun saree it is easier to walk across to a cut piece cloth center to be able to get a, a blouse piece which is a, a 1.2 meter uh, piece of cloth on khun that is there but over and above the khun as well what you have is that the khun is also associated with religious uh, symbolism uh, symbolism in the sense that uh, deities around the region are typically offered a piece of cloth and typically that small piece of cloth for the deity would be the khun fabric now other than that you also have what is very popularly uh, uh, used in the area which might be used either either as a shela or if the shela was used on a day on day basis it's also known as a chadar and that chadar is typically now produced recorded to be produced it's a coarse cotton cloth and today it might it is produced typically around the kolhapur area but is very prevalent in the pune market when you when you see uh, the chadar that is there it is typically used day on day most people sort of use it as as in terms of rough usage then of course you have uh, the uh, you know the various cottons that come in so remember Pune is very close to the cotton producing region so you have the various cottons that come in from the vidarbha region and those typically also have a tradition of hand block cotton that is that is uh, uh, used again it was used more on a daily wear basis and uh, that hand block uh, cotton is actually very suitable for the weather as well because it allows uh, uh, you know people to sort of uh, be in a weather which which allows the the fabric itself it breathes quite a bit in terms of the silk fabrics that are available perhaps one of the most popular ones outside the pitani is the narayan peti now the narayan peti typically is again south maharashtra today produced in south maharashtra as well as produced in north karnataka and the narayan peti is mostly a silk fabric that is there and in the silk fabric they have a border and those borders can be of various kind it could be the rudraksh border which is basically it looks like a round rudraksh it could be a floral border it could also be maharashtra is known for what is known as the karvatti border the karvatti is nothing more than just uh, karvatti actually is a very interesting origin because karvatti basically means the jagged end of a tools of a carpenter so if you have ever seen the saw that is there the jagged end that is there that's called the karvatti and that karvatti actually looks like peaks of uh, mountains and because of that very often it is confused and referred to as well as the temple border it has nothing to do with temples it is it has everything to do with everyday tools and the karvatti border again is something that is fairly popular in in a narayan peti now the, the thing about a narayan peti again it is in bright colors but their borders and the pallu are going to be very contrasting jewel tones so typically the more common jewel tones uh, allow for rudraksh but in some places you might also find uh, karvatti that would be there then there is uh, you know there's there's also a form of sari that is there which is prevalent in in the textile market which is known as the ganga jamuni sari now what what is a ganga jamuni sari that's typically produced uh, and supplied later in in the pune market is from uh, solapur now this is basically it's plain weaving on either side very solid colors and because it has a double shading cloth it is known as ganga jamuni and therefore there are two kinds and there is also various kinds of kosa silk that come in from uh, again from uh, the greater maharashtra Na nagpur area and that kosa silk is basically a uh, rougher silk that is there or what is known as the desi tasar that is also very prevalent within the market and has a huge demand so it's still available there is of course uh, you know as as things have moved in and as uh, people have more and more um, uh, you know access to uh, goods that are produced elsewhere so it must be added at this point in time that there is a fair bit 
uh, of availability of sarees and textiles that are produced in Dharmavaram as well as Kanjivaram. But those again are limited to people who would like to use it. In terms of ceremonial purposes, again, they follow more or less that that is produced in and around southern Maharashtra as well as northern Canada. Now, in that, you also have a kind of cotton textile, which is again, uh, because it has the kar Karvati border, is known as the Karvat Kati Sari which is basically, uh, um, you know, produced in, in southern Maharashtra, but it is uh, mostly solid cotton and sometimes may also be silk or tassar mixed, but basically it has the saw edged that is there, the temple uh, border as it's referred to. And that's possibly one of the things that used to be locally Pune made. And with, with the scattering of your craftspeople all over the place, you've often found that, uh, you know, the Karvat, uh, Karvati Sari, is fairly popular, but then again, it is now no longer produced there. Most of the handloom actually, today there are, we are in a very sad position where Pune does no longer has any handloom clusters left. What, like as I mentioned, there's only one or two odd uh, power loom mills that are there, which allow them for faster production. But as such, the local tradition that has been there of the fabrics being put in have pretty much gone though in terms of what is available for uh, uh, you know for the market a lot of the taste is still determined by what is the cultural memory that is already there so whether it is the python which comes in from the ULR or the python region or it is the narayan pate we find all sorts of patterns still available they're just not produced in pune anymore so very quickly i'd also just want to go through uh, in terms of before i open up for the question uh, I'd like to go through in terms of, um, uh, you know, uh, the cloth manufacturing as well as the retail sectors that are the centers that are present in and around Pune. Now, Pune, uh, like I said, does not have any cloth mill except for the exception of the Sri uh, Chintamani silk mills. Now, that's based a little further off from Pune uh, in a smaller place uh, in the outskirts, which is called Thiur. And it is there in Thiur that they produce, uh, uh, you know, um, 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 in, within mills, very fine cotton saris that are still available. They also have a retail outlet within the city, uh, in the older city area, which uh, runs under the name of Kundan saris. Uh, if you are really looking to get into a retail place of, of historical significance, I think your first stop would be uh, a, a, a very, very old, but also uh, significant in terms of the history, in terms of the architecture, because it's still the original shop that survives. Um, I would uh, encourage you to go across to Ravivar Pit and uh, have a look at a place called Kasat. Kasat has been in operation for a number of years. They have a standard uh, shop, which is there, which is the, the, the placement that is there is also something that's uh, quite peculiar to this region, which is that you have various sections within a shop and you can walk into whichever section. Each of these sections carry different kinds of saris. So you will have a section that will be uh, specifically only for the cottons and you will have a section which will only be for the silk. In terms of the silk, you will have a smaller uh, demarcated area or a shelf area that would be there for a for a silk pythony versus a cotton pythony, for a for a Narayan paint, a pure Narayan paint, which is handloom or something that might have been mill made in that sense but Kasat is worth uh, visiting because the old structure still remains and they have a fairly uh, great collection the other place that uh, is also worth uh, you know investing some time in is a very small place uh, which is on Lakshmi road called uh, Goryani Mandli now Goryani Mandli again has a very interesting history Goryani Mandli today is run by uh, two ladies however it was started in the 1920s and it was actually started by the original founder with uh, uh, with an aim to be able to promote Indian culture and Goryani Mandli also has uh, you know it's, it's got a fair bit of historical re relevance because uh, they are uh, they, they have often been mentioned but it's also known that Mahatma Gandhi visited this particular shop because that was a time when the Swadeshi movement was going on uh, in terms of Goryani Mandli that's one of the places where you can find things across spectrum so whether you're looking for the uh, uh, you know you're looking for, for children's clothes which is again a, a specific kind of uh, cloth that children wear which is made 
made out of khun fabric which is known as the pakhir pola and uh, or you are looking for uh, a, a, a you know small levels of nawari that are there or you know little imitation jewelry whether you're looking for the shela whether you're looking for the ordinary kinds of feta or the pagadi you typically find that in or or even the pitambari or uh, any of the things that are associated with ceremonial dressing and smaller stuff that's needed for ceremonial uh, purposes is typically available at goryani mandli so when you go to goryani mandli you should actually insist on having a word or two with the owners because they themselves are very knowledgeable where goryani uh, where their uh, you know historical tradition is concerned where their uh, uh, you know uh, where where the uh, the ceremonial cultures around pune are concerned because they're right in the thick of things then quite close to uh, that place is also another place which also sells very very similar kind of stuff and uh, that shop is called as chalgar a chalgar again will have your standard khun fabric it doesn't have too many textiles that are there but yes it does have a dhotar it will have a pitambari it'll again um, you know be able to pro uh, provide clothes for the children all of that will be the smaller things are present then there is of course um, there is the, there is a very landmark place uh, uh, again around the same corner which is in in, in the pates which is uh, which is known as peshwai peshwai again is pretty much like kasat it has uh, a couple of different floors you can go in and explore all kinds of fabrics and you also get a sense that all sorts of silk fabrics are uh, fairly available there because you do have a very fine selection of kanjivarams as well as banarasis as well as uh, you know you might even find a dhakai cotton because they that well stocked and they say that there's a lot of demand for it as well um then outside of the old area i think it's perhaps also worthwhile that you might want to check out a a place which is fairly new but also carries the entire spectrum whether it's a narayan pet whether it's a uh, it's a nawari uh, of various forms whether it's an exclusive uh, banarasi whether it's an ilkal sari that might be needed or even the later ones that have come in in terms of khon or mixed silks that are there this is a place in goregaon uh, sorry koregaon Kore park which is called karigari they are also present online this is a new bunch of uh, young people who have gotten into it where uh, the lady who's at the helm of it is uh, not just very qualified but she also has a very fine artistic eye as well as a pulse of of the region so these are across board some of the places that are there though at karigari i must warn you that they do exclusively only for women they don't have too much for men but they know their customers and they know uh, what they're looking for and they they've often got supply chains from across india so that's pretty much it in terms of if you were going out to look at places to buy things also when we are talking about textile traditions you have to be aware that uh, uh you know any form of dress also undergoes its change as most of us know you know it changes according to how life evolves and that's also the same for uh, nawari now in terms of nawari i think uh, you know we typically understand it only as the brahmani or uh, the lokal maratha but what is uh, fairly surprising is that the nawari itself has been uh, very influenced by um, uh, you know the later the 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 marathi movie industry so it's and also the hindi movie industry so it's 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 good to see that you know you have various patterns that come in and they are named after local marathi serials because of a particular way that the nawari was uh, worn in that particular serial or you could have something which would be uh, you know associated with a particular movie so when you um, uh, you know when you when you have a movie that comes out which may be talking about or has uh, the protagonist wearing a nawari that particular style is immediately copied and it's it's made available so that's one of the things which is which is actually uh, relevant to sort of uh, explore there but i think it's also um, it's also very interesting that when you when you see the nawari today is the fact that uh, you know you really don't get to learn how to wear it you you of course have youtube tutorials you have books that have been written about it but in the pune region if you go to a shop and you want to go it they they probably go and call in a tailor for you to get ahead with that Okay so the first question that has come in is what are the traditional motifs that are visible on a paithani saree ah so that's that's actually uh, one of my favorites so in terms of of the traditional motifs that are are sort of uh, present is as as i mentioned there is uh, so now i'm still not able to see any of the questions Ah, uh, okay. Thank you. So you're going to be sending it here in that sense. Okay. So in terms of uh, in terms of the uh, you know in terms of the uh, 
motives that are there i think perhaps one of the most important is the peacock motive it's a single peacock motive that's there then there is the uh, there's a dual peacock motive which is basically got a marathi term for it as well but basically two peacocks which are within a sort of form a semicircle and uh, that's that's very common then there is the the munia motive which is a single bird motive that is there so you'd see them splattered all across the the uh, the sari but what is also relevant here is that you know there there are two kinds of motives that are present in a paithani that within the body of the sari and that within the pallu of the sari or the edge of the sari now in the pallu of the sari typically you will have a lot of uh, gold and silver that has mostly gold that is that is mixed with silk and that's likely to have uh, things like and these days you have you have an evolution in terms of the motifs because you you also have larger broader motifs that have come in but otherwise it is typically a larger one of the one that's present within the body of the sari you'll also have various flowers of course you had the champa you have the uh, uh, you know you have the, uh, the the rudraksh motif then you have uh, binds that are uh, you know sort of put in so they, these 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 uh, motif motifs are pretty much present in in a paithani again the motives are also something that that talk about um... Uh, uh you know they talk about how uh, the evolution has taken place because if you look at uh, the way the motives have been present especially under the adil shahis it was more or less without a representation of any form it was mostly vines in terms of flowers and other things but under the peshwas what was very very popular was the munia uh, the munia itself or, or holding a parrot itself is something that has been uh, uh, you know sort of popular throughout the iconography of that area uh, and uh, the various craft during the peshwa era so the other question that i have is uh, uh, navari is an evolving form of sari draping yes yes that's how you have the jija mata uh, navari which is uh, these days uh, fairly popular then you had a bollywood movie which was on the pesh, uh, peshwa uh, though that is there then there are others which are you know there's a particular form of lavani you, you have lavani artists that are there Th those are likely to wear a sari in a particular modification again those are those are fairly popular though at most points in time uh, for traditional purposes people do follow uh, the system of either wearing a marathi or a brahmani navari but other than that there has been a fair bit of uh, evolution where that form is concerned as well but like i said um, in most places now because they are prestige there has been there's been a lot of variation that has taken place uh, so what is goryani mandli uh, where precisely is goryani mandli okay goryani mandli is on lakshmi road now uh, in order to explain it to you as to how it is it's it's uh you know once you get you can actually google them they're present in lakshmi road they they have a fairly small uh, exterior but right inside there are a fairly big shop so if you google them you'd be able to find goryani mandli otherwise uh, you know once the map is up you can see it because we would have something on the map did gandhi have an impact on pune textile history yes yes in fact the swadeshi movement itself had a huge impact on pune and as a result it also had an impact on the textiles and also remember that gandhi uh, through various periods in history was also uh, you know uh, he was uh, sort of uh, arrested and put in the aga khan hall as a result of that uh you know while gandhi was around and even before that i think because pune had a tradition it started off the entire concept of economic boycott is something that is attributable to a lot of people who were from pune so you you know when you see the national movement you see tilak and his contribution towards pune 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 culture you uh, uh you see the impact that they had as a result of that swadeshi itself became so prevalent that you had the uh, you know you had a special class of stores that came up in pune which were known as the swadeshi stores and uh, their in, entire uh, focus was the fact that they would only be keeping what were locally produced products and in that that's how they were called swadeshi so in that you had the parcham which is the the flag that was there then you had the gandhi topi gandhi topi even today is worn by community elders in uh, community functions then you had uh, uh, you know you had you had hand woven um, uh, textiles that were available so all of that gandhi continues to be a very strong impact uh, even today in terms of how uh, pune views itself in terms of its identity so uh, you know gandhi's influence is massive but more importantly i think it be more uh, accurate to say that the freedom struggle had had a lot of impact on puneri culture and, and continues to show itself in in the pride that the region takes itself over that 
uh, anyway, so for those of you who who have been watching this, I would definitely encourage that because Pune has uh, is undergoing drastic changes at at current with a newer uh, set of evolution that is taking place, both um, in terms of economically, in terms of the population. Large parts of its culture are being uh, overwritten by the newer codes that are coming in. Whether good or bad, that's not for me to comment. But what is there is that. Uh, a lot of these places are places that are not likely to be around for very long because there is the commercialization aspect, there is the economic impact that is there of uh, carrying on with things that are much beyond its time. So before they disappear, I'd actually encourage you to go out into the older pits of Pune and just walk around, walk around, talk to those people. They, they are repositories of their own historical tradition, whether it's textile or anything else. Uh, a Puneri is typically a very proud, uh, a pr very proud representative representative of their culture and therefore it's always a pleasure to interact with them and get to understand from their point of view so go local there go for a walk around the city once it's safe and figure out for yourself and in case you have anything interesting then i'd absolutely encourage you to write into sahapedia or you can reach out to me at uh, my facebook page which is talishka tehelnama it's been an absolute pleasure to talk about the textiles of pune and i hope you had as much fun doing this as i had thanks a lot